Let me, in just two seconds, take you to the surface of another world. To do that, we'll have to go back about 20,000 years from the present, while also dealing with temperatures 10 degrees lower. What you just briefly saw is what separates the globe as it is today from what it was at the end of the last glacial maximum. At that time, the cold had its grip on a large part of the planet, and the average temperature of the globe was 6 degrees lower than it is today. Although this temperature difference was much more pronounced in some regions than in others. Thus, in the Alps, it was on average 10 to 12 degrees colder than it is today. In the Arctic, the average temperature is 14 degrees lower. And in doing so, even though it's the same planet, it's also, and definitely, another world. Because, in addition to the Antarctic and Greenland ice caps, which have become considerably larger and thicker, there are then absolutely colossal expanses of ice that cover a large part of the continents in the Northern Hemisphere. These ice sheets were formed by the accumulation of snow which, over thousands of years, compacts and settles under its own weight, to the point of turning into ice into a glacier of enormous size. Thus, the Laurentide Ice Sheet then covers a large part of North America with a layer of ice nearly four kilometers thick from the Arctic down to the latitudes of New York. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Atlantic, the Fenoscandian Ice Sheet, which is up to three kilometers thick in some places, smothers northern Europe, from the British Isles to the northwest of Siberia, reaching down to the north of present-day Germany and Poland. These two giants of ice are not simply vast expanses perpetually covered in snow as far as the eye can see, but regions that are almost entirely submerged. Under several kilometers of ice that flows and moves, by following the shape of the landforms and reshaping the landscapes it encounters along the way. Completely filling the valleys and leaving only the highest mountain peaks sticking out in some places. Elsewhere in the world, other smaller ice caps also appeared. Iceland, the Pyrenees, the Alps, the Carpathians, the Caucasus, the Tibetan Plateau, the Himalayas, Tasmania and southern New Zealand are crushed under the weight of the ice. Whereas today, Permanent ice covers barely 3% of the entire planet's surface and a little less than 10% of the land area. Some 20 millennia ago, these proportions were nearly two and a half times higher. It was so cold back then that even the peaks of islands like Crete or Corsica had their own small glaciers during those times. In South America, the vast majority of the Andes, from Peru to Patagonia, were even covered by a layer of ice, which, in a way, extends southward for several thousand kilometers, eventually connecting with Antarctica. Because at that time in winter, absolutely massive stretches of prehistoric sea ice covered the high latitudes. So it would have been theoretically possible to walk across the frozen surface of the oceans to travel from Ireland to North America or from southern Patagonia to Antarctica. And these oceans with their frozen surfaces are not only much colder, but also much lower. Because the roughly 50 million cubic kilometers of water that are now trapped as ice on the continents were gradually taken from the oceans over time through evaporation. And in doing so all around the world, the ocean levels dropped by 120 meters, exposing much of the continental shelves and shallow sea floors. In Europe, it was literally possible to walk from the north of the continent to the British Isles by walking on the bottom of the now-vanished sea. Further east, where the Bering Strait is today, a vast land bridge connects Siberia to America. Further south has the Sea of Japan closed up, and the archipelago is then directly connected to Korea, from where it's possible, by crossing the dried-up Yellow Sea to walk to China. While the island of Taiwan has become one with the continent. Here, the shallow seabeds that today separate Sri Lanka from the Indian subcontinent have emerged, and the two have essentially merged on the surface. There, one can cross a dried-up Persian Gulf without getting wet. Did the southern tip of the Arabian Peninsula fuse with the Horn of Africa, and did the Red Sea, temporarily dead, turn into a salt lake? Meanwhile, further north, the Black Sea shrank dramatically, as at that time, it was cut off from its connection to the Mediterranean a sea that also lost its former glory, and within which, during the last glacial maximum, the east of Italy is connected to the Balkans and the south of Greece to Turkey, and vice versa. 
In South America, Argentina's east coast expanded by nearly 200 kilometers in some areas, adding hundreds of thousands of square kilometers of land to the continent. Further north, the Florida Peninsula, like that of the Yucatan, is about twice as large as it is today. Meanwhile, the Caribbean islands, like others globally, have grown in size, and numerous new islands have emerged from the sea. Just like in the Indian Ocean, where the Sayad Mala Bank, which today is a vast area of seabed covered with remnants of shallow coral reefs, was, only 20,000 years ago, a large group of low-lying islands rising just a few meters above the surface and covering an area as large as the island of Cuba. But the regions most affected by the drop in sea levels are certainly those of Oceania and Southeast Asia, whose coastlines at that time were so altered that it was considered necessary to give them new names. In Oceania, the two main islands of New Zealand have become one, and Australia is now directly connected to the south, to Tasmania, and to the north, to New Guinea, which together form a single, continuous landmass, renamed for the occasion as Sul Plus. To the north, you can literally walk from Southeast Asia to the islands of Borneo, Java, Sumatra, and maybe even as far as the Philippines. This vast area, made up of almost half land reclaimed from the seas, has been named Sundaland. There you find the largest tropical rainforest in the world at the time, as well as, in the center, a savanna corridor spared by the monsoon rains. And it is believed that this is the route the first sapiens took to reach Oceania. Just like the Sul, which, although bordered by forests on its edges, was at that time inside nothing but a vast desert, half of it covered by shifting sand dunes. Sundaland is, in some places, not spared from severe aridity. It must be said that, generally speaking, during the last major ice ages, severe drought prevailed almost everywhere inland. On the one hand, the presence of the Inland Six caused both the temperature and the rates of evaporation and humidity in the air or at high latitude to drop. And then, as the sea receded, the distance between the shoreline and the inland areas increased significantly. In some places, there are dozens, sometimes hundreds of additional kilometers of land separating the oceans from the center of the continents. And where moisture now struggles to reach, rainfall is becoming increasingly rare, even exceptional. And it was under these circumstances, with the expansion of tundra and hot and cold deserts, that the last glacial maximum occurred. Western Europe was frequently swept by gigantic sand and dust storms. In fact, if the sky of that time was often filled with dust, it was because the extreme aridity and the sparse vegetation cover allowed the powerful winds prevailing in Western Europe to lift the soil. An ideal playground for tearing from the ground the raw material used to form immense prehistoric dust storms. Just think, given the astonishing thickness reached by some sediment deposits left by the winds during these periods. It is believed that these dust storms could surpass in magnitude even the most powerful ones we can observe on Earth today. These storms from another era could rage on for entire days, sweeping through with all their might. A territory that, for more than a hundred thousand years, remained by far the largest biome on our planet, namely the Mammoth Steppe. A vast expanse without forests, where the ground remains frozen even in summer, and which stretched from Western Europe all the way to the far reaches of Eastern Siberia and China. We are tempted to imagine it. The vegetation of this cold, dry and windswept steppe was probably very similar to the present-day Siberian tundra. That is, environments that were often marshy, barely more hospitable than a frozen, moss-covered desert. Except that in reality, these areas where you could have walked in a straight line for thousands of kilometers without ever seeing a single real tree, were surprisingly fertile. Across these landscapes, endless oceans of grasses and grains stretched as far as the eye could see, roamed by large numbers of ruminants, sometimes closely followed by their predators. And even though the animal biomass and plant productivity of the mammoth steppe were similar to those of today's African savanna, don't go imagining it was a paradise. Because in these regions, at the height of the cold and dry seasons, when food became scarce or almost inaccessible due to the thin, persistent layer of snow, 
The herbivores, in order to save energy and survive until milder times returned, slowed down their growth. Thus, we have found imprints on the teeth and bones of animals living in these vast, endless steppe landscapes. The rhythm of the seasons, the record of the winters they endured. Many of these animals were encountered, hunted, and perhaps even revered by our ancestors, who painted their shadows on the walls of decorated caves. Because our ancestors also lived through these great ice ages and their sometimes harsh climates, they forced them to adapt, sometimes to turn back and migrate. During the last glacial maximum faced with the advance of the ice, the vast majority of Homo sapiens groups living in Western Europe at that time were thus forced to retreat, to look for new places to live and survive further south. It is estimated that in just a few centuries, nearly half of the territories of the European continent would be abandoned by humans. Elsewhere, in both North and South Africa, faced with the advance of the deserts, sapiens are forced to live almost exclusively in coastal areas. Because this desertification is happening on a global scale. On the edges of the steppe, in Mammoth, a deluge of aridity has given birth to the interior of the Asian continent. Just like in the eastern part of Siberia and in Alaska, to immense cold deserts where snowfall is almost non-existent. That's why these regions, although terribly cold and inhospitable, have remained free of glaciers. Here, powerful winds drive away and push back humid air from the ocean trying to penetrate the continents. As you leave the high latitudes, this polar desert gives way to a more temperate, arid climate which stretches for thousands of kilometers across Mongolia, Western China, the Tibetan Plateau, and Kazakhstan. The great hot deserts of the south, the Sahara, Namib, and Kalahari, have all expanded, still scorched by the sun. And in the Sahel, rainfall is 10 times rarer than it is today. While in South America, where, with the retreat of the sea, clouds now rarely penetrate inland. All of Argentina, Uruguay and Paraguay have been turned into a kind of patchwork of total desert. Depending on the temperatures and wind patterns, there are vast dried steppes, temperate deserts and semi-arid areas like in the more tropical north. So, all over the planet, forests are becoming increasingly rare. Because, with the advance of glacial areas and increasing dryness, many have literally given up. In the Northern Hemisphere, the tree growth limit is 20 degrees further south in latitude than it is today. In Europe, forests were pushed back to the Mediterranean edges. And the two largest regions, now covered with tropical rainforests, are not spared either. Because even though temperatures at the equator have remained relatively unchanged, the rainfall patterns have been deeply disrupted. So much so that the Amazon rainforest has greatly retreated much drier and more sparse than it is today. It was then split into two blocks, separated by vast savannas and grasslands that covered much of the eastern part of the continent. Further south on the continent, there is a temperate, deciduous forest, quite similar to those that today flourish in the climates of Eastern Europe. On the other side of the Atlantic in equatorial Africa, the tropical forest is only a shadow of its future self reduced to a few islands of greater humidity, lost in the middle of a vast Saval ecosystem. Despite everything, and even though the general trend is toward drying, a few regions are spared from this widespread lack of rain. Thus, the American West, known for its vast desert areas, was much more humid and watered than it is today. Because the presence of the massive Laurentide ice sheet pushes the jet stream southward, which then brings abundant rain to the American Great Plains of that time, where huge lakes were formed. Such as Lake Bonneville, which covered an area as vast as present-day Costa Rica. And today only a remnant remains, 12 times smaller, the Great Salt Lake. As for Lake Haute Orne, as the North American ice sheet recedes, its surface area will shrink by a factor of 50 over a few millennia. But as vast as it is, these great lakes of the American West, which number in the hundreds at the time, are nothing. If we compare them to those that for a time will appear in northern Siberia during the last great glaciation. 
after the ice sheet made its presence known, preventing the Siberian rivers Ob and Yenisei from flowing into the Arctic Ocean. In this region, and on several occasions, the wall of ice from the Inland Six moving southward will block the rainwater and meltwater coming from Central Asia, and thus create the formation of a gigantic lake system that, at its maximum, could reach an area about twice the size of today's Caspian Sea. It is even believed that this system could have exceptionally overflowed, draining a large part of its waters over several thousand kilometers toward the south, all the way to the Aral and Caspian Seas, whose areas fluctuated greatly at the time, depending on the seasons and the amount of meltwater coming from the surrounding highlands. And the sudden arrival of these waters, coming from northern Siberia, could even have caused the Caspian Sea to overflow. The overflow, following what is known as the Kumamanic Depression, would have ended up in the Black Sea, which, at that time, cut off from any connection to the Mediterranean, was the largest freshwater lake on the entire planet. During the last 2.6 million years, about 75% of the time, our planet was, broadly speaking, plagued by these types of landscapes, sometimes surreal, that we have slowly flown over. Alternating phases of extreme cold lasting 40,000 to 100,000 years and interglacial periods, with milder spells, a more temperate climate, and average temperatures similar to those we have today, then about 15,000 years ago. After being frozen for nearly 110,000 years, the ice began to melt as the world warmed up. It's the the Great Thaw begins, ancient seas will perish and new ones emerge. Giant lakes containing more water than all the ones currently on Earth will appear. Two smaller ones will dry up, others will fill, evaporate, and vast portions of the globe will slowly begin to rise. Each of these phenomena deserves an entire episode on its own. We'll talk about it next time. The thing to remember here is that in just 8,000 years, the temperature will rise, depending on the region, by 5 to 10 degrees and the sea level, with the melting of the North American and Eurasian ice sheets, will rise by 120 meters. With the disappearance of a large part of the ice covers, the maps of the distribution of ecosystems, landscapes, and climates are reshuffled. For the people who hunted the animals living in the mammoth steppe, it must have seemed eternal, but in nature, absolutely nothing is. And the latter was covered with grasses turned into mud by the thaw, meltwater, and heavier rains until it was completely taken over by forests. And this biome, which for hundreds of thousands of years was the largest you could find on land, now exists only on the high plateaus of the Altai Mountains. Those among these inhabitants who were unable to migrate or adapt have disappeared. This small apocalypse, for both landscapes and living beings, will soon mean new possible worlds, different regions to inhabit. In the wake of the disappearance of the vast mammoth steppe, as well as many other regions of the world, radically different ecosystems will quickly move in to fill the voids. There, in the taiga, it will be coniferous forests. Here, in the tundra, stretches of moss and peat bogs. This is what separates today's world from the bewildering landscapes we have visited. It's the equivalent of a blink of an eye on the scale of geological time and a difference of barely four to five degrees in average global temperature. The boundary separating the end of one world and the beginning of another can be very narrow, a few degrees up or down. It's not just about wearing an extra sweater or not. It's also what separates the possibility of a desert or a mammoth steppe from that of a forest. In an upcoming episode, we'll try to imagine the scale of a similar upheaval, this time happening over just a few centuries. If you enjoyed wandering through the landscapes of the past, then the playlist I'm putting here and above is made for you. There, you'll see the Mediterranean Sea disappear, fly over continents submerged at the bottom of the oceans, and dive into the memory of a distant time when our world was a giant snowball.